Today's Entertainment Law Update, episode 168, for June 3rd, 2024. Well, hello and welcome to Entertainment Law Update from Los Angeles, California. I am Gordon Firemark. And phoning it in today from the Nashville metro area, I'm Tamara Bennett. And we are grateful <laughs> that you're here with us, Tamara, and for you, the <laughs> audience, that you're here with us, too. <laughs> this is our podcast about entertainment law, where each month we pull together a roundup of legal and business news stories, and we share our opinions and commentary and analysis about them. And uh, this week is no different. This month is no different. Um, uh, we're not doing video this week or this month because of the travel problems with airports in Nashville and Dallas, I guess. So anyway, here <laughs> we are. That's right. <laughs> we're here audio we are. first anyway. <laughs> that, that's it. We, uh, we, we have hopefully successfully reverted to audio for this recording. I appreciate it as yeah. I'm been visiting with family and um gosh no airplanes were hardly flying wow. in the direction to or from dallas fort worth over this weekend so uh anyway wow. i don't wow. i don't have a podcast uh set up at my mom's house in what? my childhood bedroom the phone <laughs> sounds pretty good so we'll, we'll go with it <clears throat> Well, let me do the ad read real quickly here. This episode of Entertainment Law Update is sponsored by JD Supra, a leading platform in professional services content marketing, helping lawyers turn their expertise into marketing, excuse me, networking opportunities, media visibility, and new business. JD Supra publishes and distributes blog posts, articles, podcasts, videos, and other thought leadership to hundreds of thousands of subscribers each day, and that includes business leaders, in-house counsel, media members, the C-suite, and others with a need-to-know interest in legal, regulatory, and compliance matters. JD Super clients not only enjoy wide readership of their thought leader content, they're also provided with the data and tools to turn visibility into marketing and business development success. You can get more information about JD Super by visiting resources.jdsupra.com. And we have kind of a full rundown, so we're going to get right into it today with uh, the article about the Supreme Court ruling, Warner Chapel versus Neely. Uh, Warner Chapel Music Inc. versus Neely in the U.S. Supreme Court. The Copyright Act entitles a copyright owner to obtain monetary relief for any timely infringement claim, no matter when the infringement occurred. Tamara, you want to jump in on this? Yeah, so... Really, the, the question presented, you just read the holding, but was whether the Copyright Act statute of limitations yeah. for civil actions, that's 17 U.S.C. 507B, precludes retrospective relief for acts that occurred more than three years before the filing of a lawsuit. So in a 6-3 opinion by Justice Kagan on May 9th, and there were you know three dissenting opinions mm -hmm. from Gorsuch, Thomas, and Alito, uh, and there you go. There's the doorbell. Sorry about that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the dispute arises from a defunct partnership between Music Specialist Inc., founded by Sherman Neely and Tony Butler in 1983. Um, while Neely was serving a two prison terms, Butler, unbeknownst to Neely, independently licensed the uh, copyrighted works owned by Music Specialist to Warner Chapel. And those songs were then included in uh, the song Jam the Box, featured in Flo Rida's hit In the Air. It generated substantial revenue through various media uses and outlets. In 20 after teen, after Neely was released from prison, he, he sued Warner Chapel for copyright infringement dating back to 2008. So looking back 10 years mm -hmm. and asking the court to award him those damages, not just that three-year look-back window that... We thought Petraea, the, for the yeah. previous Supreme Court decision, told us that was as far as we could look back and get damages. Mm -hmm. um, so under the at the trial court, uh, the court did rely on Petraea versus Metro Goldwyn, Goldwyn Mayer saying within three years after the claim accrued, that's 507B, that's it. That's the limitations uh, period. But this really hinged on the application of the discovery rule. Yeah. And so under the alternative view of the act's limitations provision, a claim accrues when the plaintiff discovers with due diligence or 
due diligence or should have discovered the infringing act. And I think in most other areas of the law, mm -hmm. we're very used to the application of the discovery rule. I mean, if you really didn't know yeah. your, this had happened, you should be able to use this, this tool mm -hmm. and this rule. And Warner Chapel, who's the defendant in this case, they never challenged whether or not the discovery rule should be applied. Uh, or the timeliness of his claims. But Warner Chapel argued that even if Neely could sue under the discovery rule for infringement, uh, he, going back that 10-year period, he could just recover those damages for the last three years. And the district court agreed, relying on a decision from the Second Circuit, the court held that even when claims for old infringements are timely, Monetary relief is limited to the three years prior to the filing of the action. Uh, this was an came out of the 11th Circuit. And on mm -hmm. the appeal, the 11th Circuit overturned the district court ruling, aligning with the 9th Circuit, reading that the plain text of the Copyright, does not copyright Act does not support the existence of a separate damages bar for an otherwise timely copyright claim. And imposing such a bar would, quote, would gut the discovery rule by eliminating any meaningful relief for the very claims it is designed to preserve. <laughs> so, you know, where we've got the lower court saying three years only, the 11th Circuit saying we can look back, and the Supreme Court opinion by Justice Kagan, which was one of the shortest Supreme Court opinions I think I've ever reviewed, <laughs> um, on cert, they reviewed whether the discovery accrual rule applied to the circuit courts, a copyright plaintiff can recover damages for acts that allegedly occurred more than three years before filing the suit. The, sort the court said it has never decided whether the assumption that the discovery rule governs the timeliness of copyright claims is valid, but that issue is not before the court because Warner Chapel didn't challenge it. Hmm. The court emphasized the Copyright Act statute of limitations establishes a three-year period for filing a suit. And I've been working under the assumption, and I think the Fifth Circuit mm -hmm. says, well, that's all you can get for the damages is three years. Yeah. Um, but the court assumed upon it. Anyway, the singular clock means there is no separate three-year limit for recovering damages from the date of infringement. If we just say you can file and you only get three years going back. Mm -hmm. The Copyright Act's remedial sections also do not impose a time limit on monetary relief. Uh, those remedial sections, 504A through C, uh, there's no limit on monetary recovery. So a copyright owner possessing a timely claim for infringement is entitled to damages no matter when the infringement occurred. I mean, the court mm -hmm. went on to also look at that in Petraea, the reason they capped the three-year damages was fact-specific. She knew. She knew. Yeah. There was not a discovery rule issue in that case. Yeah. And, and saying that this is different. He did not. It was reasonable that the plaintiff <laughs> did not know or should have known because he was incarcerated. So... That's that's the ruling out of the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. How do yeah. you think it's going to play out? Well, I, I think that we will see some more cases coming in that we wouldn't have, assuming that the Petraea rule was, you know, governed the stat, the entire statute of limitations and the ability to sue at all. But uh, yeah, I think there <laughs> we'll see more plaintiff cases uh, uh, coming in with these these kinds of facts, although it is a fairly narrow fact situation. You know, how often does a plaintiff not realize that an infringement is happening when there's enough damages to worry about it in those early years, you know? Um, I mean, I, yes. And I also wonder, I mean, I don't think it's just a blanket coverage that if you were incarcerated that you wouldn't know or couldn't have known. Yeah, you know, I, 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 again, I think that was very fact specific to this. Yeah, case. Yeah. 
And and yeah, how could Neely have not? Well, I mean, you, you could ask the question either way. How could Neely have known, or how could he have not known that this song he wrote was, uh, or these songs he wrote were making a lot of money for someone else? Uh, but I do think. I mean, I. I and maybe it does bring about more cases where it it suddenly becomes more palatable to take the case for attorneys. Mm. I hate to say that. Yeah, I don't think if, that's it. If they could, if they could go back further than three years, mm. but I'm also concerned that there may that there are lots of cases where people knew and it just it's never been worth it, you know, to afford the fees to proceed. So, yeah, I, I don't know what, how, how we'll see this kind of play out. Well, um, it, it will be interesting. You know, one interesting thing in the dissent is Justice Gorsuch took issue with the court sidestepping the real fundamental question of whether the whether the Copyright Act and the discovery rule are compatible with each other, essentially, and and, and sort of punted. And left the, the issue for a future case, even though there, you know, there there are these assumptions about the discovery rule. Uh, the dissent suggests that the act doesn't really accommodate it, and sort of took the view that therefore this whole case is mute, <laughs> moot. Excuse me. Um, uh, the court addressed some procedural aspects rather than this foundational issue, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so the dissenters were of the view that no, the Copyright Act has its own. Uh, addressing of these questions um, with the accrual coming at the time of infringement. But anyway, but the case had another, uh, excuse me, the court had another case coming up um, that was going to raise this question of whether the discovery rule really applies in copyright cases. And it was Hearst Newspapers versus Martinelli. And um, the Court of Appeals, the Fifth Circuit, had... Um, had uh, reported on this, and the Supreme Court has now declined in a 6-3 majority to hear the case of Hearst versus Martinelli, and in so doing upholds lower courts' acknowledgement that the discovery rule um, uh, does apply in cases involving the statute of limitations on copyright infringement. So the three-year bar uh, is not applicable if you didn't know <laughs> that the, the infringement was occurring. So... Um, that case was uh, Anton Anthony Martinelli, photographer, sued Hearst newspaper over publications of his photos of the Guinness family, I guess the beer makers family's old estate. And uh, Hearst conceded that they infringed the work, and that the, uh, but that should the statute apply, they would pay damages. But uh, they were arguing, of course, that the um, infringements occurred too long ago, and and so on. He. He discovered the infringement in 2018 and filed in 2021, um, and so the courts ruled that that was that was uh, a legitimate case, and the Supreme Court denied cert. So now we have the expectation that the discovery rule does apply in in these infringement cases, and you can reach back in damages to the beginning of the infringement. And it was interesting in the, I, I kind of dug into that Fifth Circuit opinion just because that mm -hmm. you know, governs my, most of where my clients are, sure. are at. And it, it was interesting. The court said, well, out of three published authorities, there was only one case that actually held the discovery rule applies to copyright infringement. But none of the cases explains why the discovery rule applies to copyright infringement hmm. uh, in the Fifth Circuit. So kind of this same situation coming out of the Fifth Circuit is, well, we've just applied it, but we really have never had a conversation within the court as mm -hmm. to why. And and they still don't have it. Yeah, I was going to say, to my cert, so we still don't have the conversation. And they, right. And they still have it. But I think it's, I mean, that was not the question presented to the Supreme Court. I mean, there's probably situations yeah. where the Supreme Court answered a question that was not presented to them, but they're not supposed to, are they? Right. I mean, no. that's that's the deal. It wasn't it wasn't the issue before the court, so they couldn't. And if they answered it, it would be would it be dicta if they answered a question not presented before them? I mean, it seems like that would be a footnote that yeah. says, "Oh, by the way, you didn't ask us this, but if you had." <laughs> 
<laughs> well, uh, good on them for restricting their, uh, you know, answering only the questions presented in this instance. That's right. That's right. So, so I think in my my take, at least in the Fifth Circuit, has always been that the discovery rule applied on copyright infringements. Yeah. Um, now, now we have a another Fifth Circuit opinion saying yes, it does, and we have the Supreme Court not answering the question. So. Yeah. I think it applies. I think we need to go forward with it applying. Until further notice, with, yes. Yep, until further notice, so. All right. Well, our next case involves an interesting copyright law and preemption question. Coming out of the Northern District of California, we have X Corporation, formerly known as Twitter, versus Bright Data Limited. Bright Data, uh, this is a motion to dismiss a complaint for failure to state a claim. The... Uh, uh, Twitter, uh, well, let me give you the background. For Twitter users are bound by Twitter's terms and conditions, and under that, um, Twitter expressly prohibits scraping, and it has language in place prohibiting countermeasures to thwart obstacles that it creates to prohibit scraping. And uh, while users do own their own content, Twitter prohibits the sale of data gathered from Twitter. Twitter will sell data analytics tools through tiered subscription services and so on. So Twitter had initiated this lawsuit back in July of last year, alleging a breach of contract, tortious interference, and unjust enrichment. Bright Data moved to dismiss this for failure to state a claim and over personal jurisdiction back in October. In November of last year, Twitter filed an amended complaint, including trespass to chattel and violation of California's unfair business practices statute, as well as misappropriation. So along comes another motion to dismiss on the same grounds and the motion to stay discovery. They also brought a motion for summary judgment on the breach of contract, but in light of the motion to dismiss, that was moot. So the court denied Bright Data's claims regarding lack of jurisdiction prior to the order about the data scraping. So now the court here uh, largely groups Twitter's claims into two buckets, one for liability for accessing the systems and two, liability for scraping and selling data. Um, so the claims on access failed because Twitter failed to make adequate allegations of the specific facts, uh, specific, uh, including the damages. The court acknowledged that comparing the internet to physical property is imperfect and anything seeking relief on access is largely contextual because websites are usually open to anyone with a browser. Trespass to chattel is an intentional interference with possession of personal property that caused injury. But unless dispossession, physical damage, or personal injury occurred, it's really only actionable if the chattel is impaired as to its condition, quality, or value. And the court determined that it was largely copied on base elements, uh, with only uh, the only difference being an allegation that the scraping diminished server capacity. Um, so, and trespass to chattel also doesn't include reputational harm, so costs to prevent scraping wouldn't be taken into account. Now, under the California Unfair Business Statute, apparently all Twitter did was allege the word unfair. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, say we were misled about Bright Data posing as a legitimate user and that the IP proxies were deceptive. And um, they failed to allege that Bright Data and its customers were using their own accounts to scrape data. They acknowledged that registered accounts weren't even needed in order to access Twitter. So it would have been difficult to deem that they were misled. And uh, on tortious interference, Twitter alleged the existence of third-party contracts but failed to properly allege any tortious interference. Um, so the court didn't have any indication that there was actually any intrusion. They also failed to allege damages under that provision outside the server capacity argument. So breach of contract now, the court goes into browse wrap and click wrap agreements and so on. And while those can be enforceable, typically under California law, they're, they're viewed pretty skeptically unless there's actual knowledge or reason to believe that a customer or consumer should be on notice. So we don't even have the allegations that they ever, you know, registered or anything like that with Twitter. So how would they have accessed that? So the court determined bright data likely was on notice, but Twitter again failed to allege damages. On the scraping and selling clauses, which are the ones that are most relevant to us, 
Um, the court said this is preempted under the Copyright Act. The short explanation is that Twitter's terms effectively supplement and replace provisions of the Copyright Act. The court notes that Twitter's user-generated content license language um, tracks the exclusive rights of copyright owners under the Copyright Act and that Twitter doesn't claim ownership of content and can't exclude others from reproducing. So the court says this is a catch-22. Twitter can either keep the DMCA safe harbor by not owning or being responsible for the user-generated content, or it can claim ownership and restrict scraping. It can't do both. Now, effectively, the court deems that Twitter, by trying to exclude scraping, is exercising a copyright owner's right to exclude by imposing fees on people that want to extract and copy a Twitter user's content. So the court gives three reasons why Twitter's claims would undermine the Copyright Act. One, it interferes with the owner's exclusive rights, at allowing Twitter to exclude others from reproducing, adapting, distributing, or displaying the content. Two, it interferes with fair use, the, the right to copy or use content. Um, uh, Twitter could charge for that taking, uh, and so there's that. And then the third, it places restraints on content in ways the Copyright Act would typically not permit, essentially giving Twitter de facto ownership of content posted, even if it's unoriginal under the per original purposes of the Copyright Act. So the complaint is dismissed with leave to amend. Twitter has till this Thursday to file an amended complaint. Um, but uh, given the language of the order, that seems like Twitter's <laughs> not going to have a very good, good time trying to do that. So, so is, well, and I was just going to add, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I guess is this is this where it's landing? This is my lay person. <laughs> I, yeah. I comment on is this where it's landing today? Is to say, if Twitter wants to aggregate and the user generated content on the on on X mm -hmm. and charge somebody a third party to access that aggregated content, Twitter can do that, but Twitter can't stop another third party from aggregating content on Twitter and charging me to access it. Is that where we're at? I, I think so. I think what, what, there's, okay. what the court is saying is, hey, Twitter, you can't deprive users of rights that they would otherwise have under normal copyright law with your terms of service. So if I am uh, have an account on X as an individual, which which I do, at Tamara Ben, uh, at G Firemark, <laughs> um, if I have an issue with a third party scraping and aggregating my content, I'm the proper party to bring the issue. Twitter can't in the interim say, no, bad boys, you can't do that. <laughs> I, I suppose that's right. And then, of course, the aggregator would maybe have a fair use argument or something. That's what the AI okay. cases are going to decide for us in the next few years. But OK. And so, yeah, that was my note is, <clears throat> is yeah, well, then how does this play into AI if they're yeah. able to scrape this user generated content that, that I've uploaded? Um my personal content. Yeah, so. the, the judge is saying you can't have your cake and eat it tw too. Either Twitter, you own the content, in which case you don't have the DMCA fair, safe harbor, or the the users own it and you don't have any business being in court. <laughs> yeah, and, and well, and I think right there's that's the perfect summary. If if I at upload something that's in uh and twitter gets a take or x gets a takedown notice from the dmca because of something i loaded as user generated content they get the protection of that yeah yeah it's interesting so, on these other cases these other claims the the essentially trespass to chattel and so on you know but when i was in law school i took a, a seminar on computer law and this that was the argument that when a hacker got into a system, one of the claims was that they were a hacker or a scraper, that they were using the resources of the system that deprived the owner and other and paying users from using it, and that that was therefore a, a trespass and a um, and in and created damages. Here it seems that Twitter didn't allege those things sufficiently, so maybe that's their saving grace on on uh, filing an amended complaint but is to go old school because we won't discuss yeah. when we were in law school 
<laughs> it is old school, yes. <laughs> it is old school. But sometimes, and and over the many years we've done the podcast, we've talked about that. Sometimes we yeah. don't need a new body of law right? or a new law. We already have mm-hmm. something in place that works. Yeah. Well, um, but I'm sure somebody who just got out of law school, other than maybe talking about trespass chattels on the bar exam, Probably haven't hasn't talked about that, mm-hmm. or there was a buggy case somewhere or something. I do feel like there was some tort case we talked about. Yeah, well, you know, our editor on this uh, gave a, f- a few practice pointers that can be drawn uh, as conclusions from this. One is remember when you're drafting, you know, website terms and conditions, it's more likely than not that the terms might be deemed unenforceable unless you can demonstrate that you're, you know, that there's either that assent and notice and and you're dealing with a sophisticated party. You shouldn't try to do anything to restrict third-party access to user-generated content. And um, you have to you have to allege damages. That's not a practice player. That's basic law school 101. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll but see. But sometimes the damages is what gets skipped because you know, whether it's a a large Mm -hmm. corporation or individual, it's like, they took my stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, maybe they did take your stuff. Let's let's leave it at that. So, but we got to figure out how you, you are hurt other than you're personally offended that they took your stuff. Yeah. That's what we got to figure out. It's, it is mind boggling that lawyers for a company like Twitter, I mean, you, you know, you have to assume, I don't know who the parties, who the council were in this, but you have to assume that they had, you know, good lawyers and law firms working for them on this, but uh, somehow that got overlooked and in these complaints and we'll see what happens in the next round. So, yep. So let's do this next one. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So share, share wins, uh, her suit against the, uh, Sonny Bono trust and estate and mm-hmm. Mary Bono, the, the widow of, uh, Sonny's estate. We talked about this at, I think the, at least in episode 155, yeah. I know we've talked about this more than once in the mm-hmm. last three or four years. Uh, but the ruling is uh, shares motion for summary judgment uh, were granted with a, a slight exception for a claim of breach of contract, which mm-hmm. was granted in part. Mary Bono, who is the widow of Sonny, uh, her motion for summary judgment was denied with the exception of a uh, partial counterclaim, which was denied in part. Mm -hmm. Uh, This has been an ongoing case. Cher is the plaintiff, the first wife of Sonny Bono. Obviously, they performed and recorded songs together uh, during their marriage, which their marriage ended in 1975. There was a marriage settlement agreement, uh, which gave Cher a 50% interest in receipts from recording contracts, record royalties, as well as the right title and interest to receipts from musical compositions that were payable after 1978. Uh, There was also an administration fee allowed uh, in the MSA of 10%. And then when Sonny died in 1998, uh, his widow took over. I believe he died in test day. But the the MSA Mm -hmm. controls what shares got going on. But as we've talked about numerous, numerous times uh, regarding copyright grant termination rights, in 2016, Mary, the widow, uh, issued the termination notices under the Copyright Act regarding certain musical compositions to reclaim uh, the copyright for the U.S. only because it's under the U.S. Copyright Act. And she said, oh, well, if I've reclaimed these rights, I'm no longer going to pay uh, the portion mm. that was allocated to share because there's been a termination of these grants. Uh, the court's decision on shares claim, does the termination affect her royalty rights or copyright approvals? Again, shares grant under the settlement agreement was to a royalty, not to ownership of the copyright. Yeah. And Mary claims that the copyright preempts the contract law, that there's a, just a preemption because I have this right to terminate 
Uh, so it's going to preempt your contract and that this was a grant of rights that uh, was not allowed uh, under a grant of rights, an agreement to the contrary is what the Copyright mm -hmm. Act says, that Sonny, the allegation was Sonny made an agreement to the contrary to try and cut off her ability to terminate these rights. Uh, and the court says the plain language of the MSA is that the termination of the grant may be affected notwithstanding an agreement to the contrary. This is what she argued. Mm -hmm. And the court said this wasn't an agreement to the contrary. The MSA falls wholly under state law and the works are subject to the Copyright Act. Since the termination does not terminate the marital settlement agreement or the recording contracts, the share of record royalties uh, would not be disturbed. And as well, this was dealing with the musical compositions because the royalty rights are separate from a grant of copyright. The termination under this copyright grant termination provision did not terminate her chain of ownership to those royalties. Uh, under breach of contract, given the failure of the termination to cancel shares royalty rights, she was entitled to damages. However, the court was unable to determine exactly what her damages were. Uh, Mary counterclaimed, and this was related to administration of the rights. And so there was a cap of a 10% administration fee. You know, what could Mary kind of control that or did Cher still have the ability to control things? Um, and the MSA stated that they couldn't be modified without Cher's consent as far as the recording contracts. Mm -hmm. But there, there was ability for Cher to object to certain things on the administrator. But again, I think it's letting, as long as it's fair and reasonable, letting yeah. Mary do that. I, I think essentially uh, the, it's, hey, Mary, if you want to make a 15% administration deal, go ahead. But the other 5% is coming out of your side. <laughs> you that, know? That's right. <laughs> and I think this is the way it should have played out yeah. because the language did not give share a copyright interest. It gave her a royalty interest, which in most divorces, that is how that works. I mean, the divorcing, the non-creating spouse mm -hmm. is not listed. They're not listed as an author. Yeah. Now, there may be situations where they're listed as a copyright claimant, but he had assigned those rights. So he could not make share a copyright claim. Um, he, in the MSA, mm -hmm. share got the, got the only rights he had to give, which was access to the royalty stream. So he didn't control the copyrights at the time of the divorce. He had already transferred those. So that's he, right. So there couldn't have been, an allocation of ownership of the copyrights, but that's there could right. be of and the money, the revenue. And that's what the contract was about, not the copyright. So yeah, yeah, this is the right conclusion. I think um, it is. And, and so Mary, the surviving spouse, and it has to be more than has to be 50%. So I don't, mm -hmm. anyway, I, there's not a challenge. I think, I, well, I think initially there were some challenges to whether or not her termination notices were effective and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But it doesn't interfere with her ability to reclaim the copyright, but mm -hmm. what it, but it also means they can't cut share out of yeah. the royalty. So I, I do think this was right. And, and, you know, we did just talk, preemption in the earlier case mm -hmm. and this community property if you're in a community property state we need to really think about what it means to have a royalty interest slash revenue interest versus a grant of copyrights or an a an agreement to grant copyrights in the future that's when we start getting into yep. issues with the termination provision Indeed. So, Indeed. yeah, I'm glad we kind of saw this one all the way through because so many yeah. times we, we don't get to see it all the way through. Now, we still, this was trial court ruling, so anything could happen. But as you and I both said, it sounds like it's the right decision. It seems like it's sort of hard 
hard on these facts to argue that there was some mistake of law here, but we can, if there's an appeal, we'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it looks like there was, you know, money was being held in trust yeah. and a, or, or in escrow. And so there maybe weren't damages in my mind beyond what share was owed that right. was calculated based on her percentage. Yeah. And honestly, it sounds like the parties all did the right thing here when they're when this dispute arose and the money went in, well, the, the publishers probably held the money in escrow um, or the administrators, I should say. And, and uh, you know, so it, it's, it's fairly simple to unwind um, yeah. and, and resolve. So interesting. Well, we have a whole bunch of right of publicity cases and AI related stuff to talk about here. So we'll just jump right in. First off is the Kardashians. Uh, it involves the Kardashians, I should say. And the issue in the case of uh, Barbetta versus Kardashian and NBC Universal uh, asks, is there a cause of action for individuals caught in the background of photos to sue under their right of privacy or publicity? Kim Kardashian's stylist assistant posted a photo on Instagram. This is in 2014, 10 years ago. Uh, it caught the appellant in the background by mistake. And in the picture, Kardashian, the stylist, and an assistant – are, are at one of Kardashian family's boutiques. Barbetta alleged that this constituted an advertisement or promotion of the boutiques and that she suffered unwanted attention, potentially damaging her reputation, and she did not consent before the photo was published nor receive any compensation, so she claims damages under New York Civil Rights Law Sections 50 and 51, which is the right to privacy for commercial uh, uses of names and likenesses. So... Uh, the court ruled that uh, in dismissal that it was uh, not a proper cause of action. Uh, the courts have long protected the right of privacy of those whose name, image, and likenesses um, uh, are, are used under these civil rights law sections 50 and 51. Um, and those instances typically consider the nature of the photo in question, the extent to which the individual is captured, and what steps, if any, were taken to obtain consent. The privacy protections only apply to ads and commercial behavior uh, done without an individual's consent. And the court said the Instagram post was not an endorsement of the boutiques. This was not intentional advertisement or commercial activity by Kardashian or NBC Universal. So there's not an enforceable right of, public, uh, of recovery from the original complaint. And they cite a couple of cases, Darden versus One United Bank, in which um, the courts addressed what is a an advertising purpose and that looked at whether it appears in a publication which taken in its entirety was distributed for use in or as part of an advertisement or solicitation for patronage of a particular product or service. And DeMauro versus Advanced Publications, uh, which says the statute is to be narrowly construed and strictly limited to non-consensual commercial appropriations of those factors. And Connaughton versus Chipotle Mexican Grill, dismissal of a complaint is warranted if the plaintiff fails to assert facts in support of an element of the claim, um, or allegations or inferences to be drawn don't allow for enforceable right of recovery. So no recovery here. Yeah. And, and I probably, it could have been different if there had been one simple change to the facts mm -hmm. that Kim Kardashian or a Kardashian had posted the image. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that that may have changed. It. That may have changed. Been the one factor to have changed it, but it yeah. was an assistant who was, you know, who knows what the caption line was with yeah, it or, hanging or out. Or if it was posted her. on the account of the boutique rather than on an individual's account. Yeah, yeah, something like yep. that might have been. Yeah. So might next up, we have Scarlett Johansson. You want to do this one? Yeah, so this has just been kind of interesting just to follow along yeah. in the nightly news. <laughs> so Scarlett Johansson, famous actress, uh, threatened to sue OpenAI for allegedly copying and imitating her voice for the new AI system named Sky. Uh, the company had previously asked her to allow them to use her voice, but she declined. Johansson claims the similarity between her voice and the released Sky demo was intentional because in May, the CEO, a CEO of OpenAI had tweeted her on X uh, mm -hmm. and said apparently a reference to Johansson's role as an AI assistant in the movie of the same 
name. Her. Johansson. Uh, yeah. Her in the tweet tweeted yeah. her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, in that movie, her. Yeah. So Johansson hired legal counsel who wrote two letters to OpenAI, asking them to detail the process by which they created the voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's unlikely Johansson will sue because OpenAI dropped Sky. Mm-hmm. So sorry, it was the quote, quote unquote, movie her. Yeah. Uh, and so what? What's the precedent we're looking at? The Midler v. Ford Motor Co. Uh, Ford had asked Midler to sing a song for advertisements. Gosh, we don't have the year in here. What year was that? In the eighties, I think it was nineteen seventy nine. Uh, I think is when the Midler ca- case came down. Around yeah, eighty something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she had declined. Bette Midler had, and then they hired a voice impersonator. Mm-hmm. And the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held for Midler and focused partly on the fact that Ford had asked, yep. and that suggested her voice had value. Her name, mm-hmm. image, and likeness had value. Uh, the Tom Waits case versus Frito Lay. Uh, Stephen Carter imitated Waits' voice in a commercial for the snack food company. Waits sued for voice mm-hmm. misappropriation under California law and false endorsement under the Lanham Act. Uh, court ruled for Waits. Again, I think that was a 1980-ish uh, case. The distinctions, Mittler's voice and Waits voice are distinct, whereas AI seeks to create a, quote, generic style of voice. Is that a distinction? I don't know. Uh, Additionally, chat GPT is not an advertisement like in right. both of those cases. So I, I guess this is the same questions I had. Is, mm-hmm. is this a, is a generic style AI is going to be protectable under right of publicity? Um, if the materials used to train the AI system substantially rely on the voice of a natural person, does that make it generic or unique? Unique. I mean, and is there something under the Lanham Act we need to be talking about? Could I, as a consumer, as lawyers, we often forget that the Lanham Act is a Consumer Protection yeah. Act, not a Business Protection Act. <laughs> uh, could I, as a consumer, erroneously believe the voice was Joe Hansen's and some? Somehow that led to an endorsement or sponsorship. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it is uh, causing confusion. I don't think it's material to a purchaser's decision to use that tool. I mean, I guess the facts could support something, but that's that's where that I mean, come, falls apart. I guess so. I mean, I'm kind of thinking, gosh, I hate to even say S I R. I, cause she might think I'm talking to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Other voice personal assistants. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, Alexa, uh, Alexa, I don't have that. So I can say mm-hmm. that. And I don't think anything will think it's, I'm talking to it. Yeah. You know, I get to pick which, if I want the Australian yeah, which version, yeah. which voice I want. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe I want the Johansson voice or uh, her husband's well, voice. You know, or, a, that's an, <laughs> That's an interesting precedent here because, you know, for a while you've been able to get like for your navigation tool or whatever that's that's risk telling you turn by turn directions or I think for even for the uh, certainly for the Amazon one. I'm not going to say her name because I do have one in the room, <laughs> but you can tell it use a different voice and sometimes they have celebrity voices available. I know you can get James Earl Jones to give you your driving directions and things like that. So there is some commercial value i guess you could say to the the sound of the voice of uh, of the device talking to you and and i think that's what concerned at least a partial concern here sag after has an interesting take on this too right yeah the, so the union maintains training ai systems on a sag member's likeness without consent is a violation of mm-hmm. the actor's rights uh, SAG AFTRA, AFTRA has published, has pushed, I'm sorry, for legislators mm-hmm. to advocate for a federal right of publicity since there is an absence of federal laws covering the use of AI to imitate actors' likeness. And we talked last month. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I can't find where the generative, here it is, episode yeah, 167. Mm-hmm. We talked about the Generative AI Copyright Disclosure Act, which was introduced in the House on April 9th. Mm-hmm. Uh, requiring AI developers to at least send a notice to copyright holders of any work 
they've used to train AI programs. So and people can go back. Yeah. Folks, listeners can go back and listen and listen or watch and listen on yeah. YouTube. Well, I think this certainly, discussion. yeah, you know, keeps this at the forefront of the public discussion and, and, uh, uh, We'll see. We'll see if if Congress decides to act on this at all, and and how they handle it too. Because here, you know, traditionally something that's been under state law, um, it'll be interesting to see how how Congress might do a federal law that occupies this field now. Um, hmm. yeah. Okay, so Gordon, this is the movie, the funniest one of the funniest things we've ever had in our rundown. What's that? Uh, purchase more. Ham and bacon. Oh yeah, it's the, <laughs> the Iowa uh, Pork Producers Association struck a deal with Iowa State University football players to promote the pork industry because the names on the back of their jerseys is Miles uh, Purchase, the Tyler are... Moore, Tommy Hammond, <laughs> yeah. Caleb Bacon. <laughs> yeah, Hammond, Hammond, and Bacon. I love it. So anyway, the image shows the guys lined up, purchase more ham and bacon. Uh, with big stacks of <laughs> pork and ham yeah. uh, in the foreground, loaded up on these uh, platters. So I don't know. I in think case you, you were wondering how covers, college yeah. athletes <laughs> are going to make money <laughs> from their name, image, and likeness, here's an example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just think that's a, a fantastic example. Mm -hmm. And yay on the Iowa pork producers uh, to pull that together. But, you know, I mean, we look, I, I it's, it's yeah. not a new concept, you know, the whole state farm with, uh, Travis Kelsey and yeah. I can't, I'm sorry. I'm completely blanking on who the other player is that's in those ads. Uh, but you know, it's just yeah. a great play on, on the name, super fun NIL, mm -hmm. uh, clip to put in there. And we've had a, kind of a big ruling that we'll see how it all plays out in mm -hmm. the past month is that the NCAA and Power Five conferences reach a settlement to allow schools to pay college athletes for revenue sharing in NIL. So yeah. the further discussion we'll have on another day is mm -hmm. are student athletes now employees? But that's a... That might be a tax question. So uh, the terms haven't, it is like that's going to come up. I yeah, mean, the terms course. haven't been disclosed, but uh, the Power Five conferences will have to pay uh, almost $2.8 billion over the next yeah. 10 years to current and former student athletes who were prohibited from receiving any revenue from endorsement and sponsor deals, mm -hmm. sponsorship deals. Uh, three separate antitrust cases. House versus NCAA, Hubbard mm -hmm. versus NCAA, and Carter versus NCAA. Uh, the Power Five conferences is the Atlantic Coast Conference, mm -hmm. the Big Ten, the Big 12, the Pac-12, and the SEC. Uh, this involved almost 184,000 or at least 184,000 wow. college athletes. Uh, and it was couched as an antitrust violation. Yeah. So the settlement has two pathways forward for compensation for NIL and revenue sharing, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is huge on the revenue sharing. Yeah. I don't know how that's really going to play out in work, but I look at it to say, you know, the one person on the team who may not get an NIL deal is mm -hmm. still going to get, should still get some revenue share. So, or more than one person, because there's probably one person on the team who's getting the bulk of the NIL. So anyway, it's estimated that the 2.8 billion uh, that the conferences and NCAA will pay to current and former athletes for lost potential NIL mm -hmm. and includes student athletes from 2016 to the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I think I kind of put in there, you know, maybe yeah. to 2034, not exactly sure when our 10 year period starts and stops. Right. right. And the second is a framework where conferences and schools will directly pay student athletes related to revenue sharing. So that's going to be money that comes in to the university athletic department for broadcast deals and ticket sales. And if an athlete, I guess an athlete has a choice to opt in or out of the future revenue sharing, but if you opt in, you don't get to sue. <laughs> you're, you, you're done. Uh, you're yeah. not going to be suing NCAA. So I 
I got to wonder, what is this going to do to the scholarships that athletes get? And how is this going to play? And, you know, is the scholarship going to be treated in advance against revenues? Are they going to get the scholarship Ooh. at all? Or, you know, or do you opt into the revenue sharing and take your chances that it's a better deal than the scholarship would have been and you still have to pay your tuition? I mean, and, and some, Gosh. you know, it advances. And these I think. are all the reasons we've, I think people have fought it, but yeah. yet I also think it is patently unfair that the reason the SEC or the yeah the conferences. Big 12 or the conferences are getting all this money and mm -hmm. we're getting paid more if we've got the 11 a.m. time slot on mm -hmm. Saturday morning for the football game you yeah. know it, it so it, more questions uh, coming up as we go it's going to be really interesting <clears throat> Well, it, it, I think it has not, while not every sport in these conferences is to the level of what I would consider being professional. I mean, they yeah. are, it's yeah. just, they may not be getting that. They're not getting the broadcast. Well, there are those that are covered by TV and those that aren't, you know, the, that's the, it. The, the javelin thrower at, at a school in the Midwest somewhere probably isn't going to receive the same kind of compensation as the, uh, you know, as the uh, star quarterback and you know all that's it's it'll be interesting to see how they handle it it'll be interesting to see whether we get into this question of employment and does even the player who sits on the bench every game get entitled to a, a share of those revenues or a minimum wage or something um yeah, we, I think this is going to be an interesting field to watch for the next few years as we, uh, uh, as we proceed. I, I mean, it really, really is. We yeah. have we have friends who were have, have either finished their eligibility period mm -hmm. or are still having eligibility period, and I'm really curious to see how it's going to play out for them. Um, one in particular has played at schools in these conferences another one didn't so you know probably yeah. doesn't not going to help our friend son <laughs> who played in a smaller conference but right. we'll see and i think there will be employment law issues about this i wrote a paper mm -hmm. it going back uh, the first time the term student athlete was used was in mm -hmm. like the 50s or 60s and there was this real concern about even doing scholarships because they were concerned the athletes would be considered employees yeah so that's the wow. next part is tax lawyers be on the lookout. Yeah. And at labor and employment folks too. I mean, it's right. A, a, a practice area ripe for the picking. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So. Well, let's do our quick take lightning round. We've got a handful of cases that we want to talk about real quickly. First off is Hayden versus 2K Games. Take two uh, interactive successfully defended itself against another tattoo artist. This time, a tattoo that was on LeBron James in the NBA 2K game. Take two con convinced the jury that no infringement had occurred because of agreements between Take Two and the NBA and LeBron James. Now, Take Two had lost one case previously in Illinois. We talked about it in episode 150. Uh, the case law and jury verdicts have typically gone in favor of Take Two and others that are like it um, on the notion essentially that de minimis and fair use arguments as well as license agreements come into play. All in all, not a big surprise. It follows the conventional wisdom um, and the take two loss in Illinois seems to be the outlier. That case involved tattoos uh, of Randy Orton in the WWE wrestling game from take two, but the court left open whether or not fair use exi existed as a matter for the jury to decide. And the Illinois court, had ruled out de minimis use as a defense, didn't provide instructions on implied licenses, which neither party objected to, uh, the jury getting that instruction, and it did not provide instructions regarding a waiver defense. So the jury came in and, and said, yeah, it looks like infringement. So anyway, so here we are, uh, another case that sort of says, hey, when it flits by as part of a you know sports player depicted in the thing, that's not an infringement. 
Okay. Well, TikTok. So the clock might be ticking on as how long we'll have TikTok access in the U.S., but at least we're going to have a great soundtrack. Uh, after three months pause between Universal Music and TikTok's, uh, a license deal has been reached. The two companies are now negotiated a deal allowing TikTok to use UMG's catalog of sound recordings. Uh, this was on a press release released May 2nd. Things had been on pause since February. Uh, users on TikTok can finally choose millions of sound recordings from superstars out of the UMG catalog to include in their videos. In a press release, the new deal intends to, quote, improve re remuneration for UMG and its artists, new promotional and engagement opportunities for the UMG recordings, and industry-leading protections with respect to generative AI. Okay, so there's something about AI in there. And in particular, UMG and TikTok try to work together to safeguard the platform against unauthorized AI generated music. So I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's a TikTok, TikTok shop uh, launched on the platform and the two companies are going to collaborate on how the, their sound recordings are used in that e-commerce service. Okay. In 2022, Trefuego, an Arizona-based artist and TikToker, was sued by Sony Music for copyright infringement, and uh, his real name is Dontrell Devon Clark Rainbolt. That's quite a name. And uh, he got a takedown notice, which he ignored, for his track 90, Mile, 90 MH, uh, which contained a sample from Japanese composer Toshimi, uh, Toshifumi Hinata, a 1986 song, Reflections. Sony alleged that Trifuego used the sample without permission, damaging the market for Hinata's work and implying a false endorsement. So the lawsuit was filed in the U.S. District Court of Arizona and then later moved to the Northern District of Texas, claimed that 90MH was featured in 155,000 TikTok videos and streamed 100 million times on Spotify. A federal judge ruled in Sony's favor, stating that Trifuego had indeed infringed on Sony's copyrights, and as a result, Trifuego has been ordered to pay $802,997 in damages, 700000 of which is profits from streaming platforms, uh, and 100000 in licensing fees to Sony. Uh, the judge, Mark Pittman of the Northern District uh, in Fort Worth, emphasized the importance of careful material selection in Trifuego's work hoping the case would serve as a lesson. He was also mandated to pay ongoing royalties, including a 50% share of publishing revenue, 20% share of recording revenue, and reimbursing $2,230 in legal costs incurred by Sony. So, so I was just going to say, if you are involved in music licensing in any way, mm -hmm. go pull this case because the court did a fantastic job or Sony's lawyers mm -hmm. did a fantastic job of laying out how these deals, how Sony would like these deals to work when you do a sample. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a great discussion on damage, actual damage calculations, because this is what this hinged on versus willfulness. Uh, there was a spreadsheet style calculation laying out all the different categories. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sony put into evidence how, what a hypothetical license would look like uh, if you wanted to sample a track, including what the upfront payment would be, the percentage of revenue, uh, the percentage of ownership, so on and so forth. Um, the judge also played out that this defendant, mm -hmm. they, they couldn't get him served. The judge finally had mm -hmm. to agree to serve him on social media. Yeah. And and so in evaluating total harm, the court can consider any profits of the infringer uh, a, as well as the actual damages that were awarded. So I think the defendant just wasn't playing nice. And the judge <sighs> said, here we go. Yeah. Interestingly, <laughs> there was no record label involved in this lawsuit as a defendant. Um. So, it, yeah, I wonder if they'll be able to get the money. Is the money gone? I mean, you know, the go well, forward licensing terms are there, yeah. but will they be able to actually collect? I don't know. Yeah. Well, and what, uh -huh. what, what was really interesting to me is just, 
you know, there doesn't this doesn't seem to be about record royalties and, and you know, the kinds of things that we would normally a few years ago have been talking about. This was a TikTok and Spotify um, use of the music. So did he even have a record company? Did he release it in the, in the traditional channels or just, yeah, no, I don't think so. I don't think there was any, there would have been some kind of ongoing payment yeah. for physical product. Right. If, so if that had been the case, so that raises all kinds of interesting eyebrows about the future of the music industry <laughs> in my view. Oh, well, th yeah, this is it because the terms that Sony laid out as to how they would negotiate this deal, mm -hmm. I've seen come across from multiple record labels Yeah, on yeah. how, what they are wanting to, what they're asking for, for a sample. Mm -hmm. So I don't think what they asked for, while again, depending on who I'm representing, I may or may not mm -hmm. agree to those terms, they were in line with what the industry is doing. Yep. So that's why I think this is a great case if you want to yeah. understand where this is going and where it's been. Uh, this yes, Sony case gives gives you a great, great uh, roadmap yep. to look at these licensing deals. And, you know, the defendant should have responded when he was trying to get served, but that's not unusual well, either. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's I guess if if the behavior is really bad, the judge does what it what he did in this case, and you know, called it out. But uh, sometimes you just can't serve the defendant because they're hard to find or hard to uh, hard to keep up with. But in any yeah, event. and I didn't. I know it got removed to Fort Worth. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with Judge Pittman. I've never had anything in a case in front of him. Mm. Um, so I obviously there was some connection to the to the defendant being here um but yeah yeah, yeah. well um, we have a, okay. a public service announcement let's talk a little bit we're ha almost halfway through the year which boggles my mind <laughs> but here we are and um it is time we started talking to our clients with existing corporations llcs and other uh, business entities that are subject to this about the corporate transparency act and the requirement of uh, reporting on beneficial ownership information. There's a system in place. It's up and running and seems to be working. Um, and uh, well, what, you know, why don't you jump in and and fill us in? Yeah. So it's one of these things that well applies to me as a business owner mm -hmm. as well as to many of my clients. Sure. Uh, I might need to comply with the beneficial ownership information report mm -hmm. under the Corporate Transparency Act. If you're a small business, having 20 or fewer full-time employees and less than 5 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm just right under that 5 million number. <laughs> right. And stuff. Yeah, right. Uh, You'll get there, don't so worry. The, <laughs> that, that, but yeah, I'll get there. So small businesses need formed prior to 2024 need to file. If you were formed in 2024 mm -hmm. as well, you need to do that. Um, so the rule is that if you were filed uh, in after January 1st of this year, you uh, have 30 days after you file. Is it 30? I thought it was 90. But anyway, 30 days after you file your entity, you're required to submit this BOI report. And it's an online uh, completion thing. Um, you have to show some you know, proof of identity and and uh, and who are the beneficial owners of the company. We'll get into the what's required. For companies formed after January, uh, I'm sorry, formed after January 1st, you have to 30 days to comply. For companies that were formed before, you have until the end of the year, essentially. Yeah, to comply. And it's like many of these online forms where you have to verify your identity, you mm -hmm. need to have your driver's license, your passport, your tax yeah. ID number, your social mm -hmm. security number. There is some gathering of information mm -hmm. as well as I think you have to like take your picture online and submit it and yeah. so on and so forth. And if the ben beneficial ownership doesn't change, you don't need to file any kind of update. But mm -hmm. we we put the link in here what I'm telling my clients are you you have to do this for yourself because it's requiring lots of personal information that I don't want to possess um, to submit and verify. So, you know, make sure if, if our if you are a listener or qualify that, that you're taking care of this for your entities. If you represent clients who qualify, I actually, and we have a link in here, I've got a little summary on my website. 
um, because we we did. Yeah. I started getting questions. Yep. Um, so so I'm, I'm telling clients about this, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm suggesting as their corporate renewal annual renewal date comes up, now's the time to do this, just to you know make it a part of that Perfect. process. However, I'm getting a fair number have asked me, well, wait a minute. Why do I have to tell the government anything more than I've already told them? And this isn't right. And, you know, um, who do they, what do they care who my silent partners are? Those kinds of things. And uh, at least a handful have decided they're going to wait to see what happens because there's an Alabama court ruling saying that this is an unconstitutional requirement. And so at least in <laughs> Alabama, <laughs> it, the uh, uh, while this goes up on appeal, this has stayed. But um, I don't see it happening before the deadline arrives and and the penalties are pretty significant if if a, uh, a company that is supposed to report a reporting entity fails to do so in the uh, in the time frame so it is uh yeah, yeah. um well that's why it's a psa the public yes. service announcement. you guys investigate and decide if uh how right you, the, what you need to do with this information? Yeah, it's <laughs> it, it's administered for those who aren't familiar with it. It's administered by the what is it? The Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, and the idea behind it apparently is to reduce the money laundering and use of of American corporate and LLC structures to uh, conceal ownership behind criminal activities and things like that. So you go to FinCEN, I'm sorry, yeah, FinCEN.gov, F-I-N-C-E-N.gov, -E and you can find out more about uh, the organization and, and the requirement for the filing and those kinds of things. So go check it out. And for now, <laughs> that brings us to the end of this episode of Entertainment Law Update. I want to say a big, big thank you to you, our loyal listeners, for spending your time with us and to our sponsor, J.D. Supra. More information about J.D. Supra, that industry-leading um, content marketing networking opportunities platform to distribute your posts, articles, podcasts, videos, and other thought leadership to thousands of subscribers on a daily basis. Go to resources.jdsupra.com. And if you have any feedback for us, and we always like it when you do, um, uh, reach it, reach us uh, on the voice widget on our website at entertainmentlawupdate.com or an email to entertainmentlawupdate at gmail.com. We have a, uh, a handle on X, formerly known as Twitter. It's at entlawupdate. And Tamara, tell folks how to reach you. Yeah, folks can find me online at uh, website tbennettlaw.com or create protect protect.com at tamara bennett t-a-m-e-r-a-b-e-n-n-e-t-t -E -E -T -T, will get you get to me on most social media websites and from los angeles i'm gordon firemark my website firemark.com email is gfiremark at firemark.com and gfiremark is where you find me on most social media also, got to say thank you to our team of volunteer contributors. They're fantastic. Our managing editor is John Janicek, Charles Thorne, Alexis Allen, and Violet Zhang all joined us. And we have a big warm welcome for two new members of our team. Tasha Spear is a, a student at Pepperdine, and Dawson Holder, a student at Cardoza. We're very glad to have them joining us on the team. And if you are interested in joining uh, the fun as part of the ELU family of contributors, reach out, entertainmentlawupdate at gmail.com. And that's going to wrap up this episode of Entertainment Law Update. Thanks again for listening. And until next time.